Well, good afternoon, everyone who has signed in thus far. Still have a lot of people signing up. We just opened it up. But uh, we have a good episode here for you on the Presidio Perspective. Uh, we have a guest speaker with us, Strider. Alas, very excited to have him with us, uh, a, a very accomplished economist and somebody who we rely on uh, for him and his team's view of what's going on uh, in the economy. Uh, their team over there at First Trust is somebody who Presidio works with e each and every quarter. So not just this one, but uh, today it's, we're excited to kind of give you a little look behind the scenes of some of the conversations we have with Strider and his team, you know, talking about the markets and of course, you know, including you in the conversation right now. So I'm going to stall for a little bit as we have people uh, signing on and, and, um, and joining us here. So, and then just a little, I'm sure most of you are Zoom technology experts by now and have been joining us and spending time uh, with us and others using this new technology. So, uh, you know, down at the bottom, you're gonna have a couple features. So, um, as myself and Strider are, are going through the presentation today, you might have some questions pop up that you wanna ask, you know, a, a nation leading economist, you know, here's your chance. So go ahead and there's a Q&A uh, uh, button that you can press, you can type in your question. Uh, we'll do our best to manage, manage the chat features, um, but, but if you want a question answered, go ahead and just put it in that Q&A. Uh, so more participants are still coming on. Um, so we've uh, moved our episode here to, um, to Wednesday afternoon here at four. So we've been doing it on Friday nights and have been highly attended the last three episodes. Uh, however, we, we, it might be better for everybody's schedules if we move. This Friday, of course, is Good Friday, so for scheduling conflicts for many people, we decided to move it up earlier in the week. So you'll get a uh, poll if you haven't already, if you can let us know. I know many of you responded as to what your uh, preferred times and days were, and so thank you for those of you who responded, but we're, we're curious to hear your feedback of uh, when you'd like to best have these events. So. Um, so getting into, you know, just a reminder of what we're doing in retirement planning, you know, there's a, there's a lot of changes that are going on, you know, daily and just so much data that we're getting in the markets. You know, as I told you in the past previous episodes, we're going to see big swings, you know, markets going up, markets going down, some of the bigger days on record. I mean, this quarter, uh, Strider is going to talk, talk to, this, uh, but we're going to see numbers like we've never seen before. Um, and so it's always very difficult to predict, you know, how those markets are going to react. Uh, but there's a lot of things that are outside of our control. When we're doing financial planning, you know, just remember, these are the big three things that we want your financial plan to address. So these by far and away are going to be the largest contributors to your success or failure, depending on how your financial plan is designed to deal with inflation, taxes, and market crashes. Remember, it's quite a balancing act to these different, different things. So, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the market crash. We'll probably be talking about a little bit of inflationary factors tonight um, and, and some potential tax changes down the road. So, you know, I want to focus on what we can control, asset allocation, tax strategy, retirement planning. So that's what is going to be, be all the difference between your success or not in, in your financial plan. So, um, Without any further ado, I'm going to bring on Strider. He has a lot to go over. Uh, so again, Strider is part of the economics team at First Trust, uh, and they have been ranked by Bloomberg as one of the top forecasters of the U.S. economy over the past several years. I was just talking to Strider a little bit ago. I've never met anybody who has actually won a crystal ball award, and I just thought that was uh, among the higher achievements I think that you can get as an economist, and, and they've gotten it several times. So, um, Anyway, we're very excited to have Strider here. So without any, uh, oh, just to give a little overview, he's gonna be talking about, of course, the contagion with COVID-19. Give us a little, um, his take on the equity markets and then the overall economy. <clears throat> so Strider, so excited to have you here today. I'll just kind of let you take it from there. Wonderful, well, it's, it's wonderful to be with you, Dustin, and everybody else. There's, there's obviously a lot that's going on right now, and I think, we really need to establish some type of foundation here. 
I think there's really two ways that you can currently look at the world. You can either look at it through a magnifying glass or you can look at it through a spyglass. And you think about that magnifying glass, it's it, by nature, it takes something that's small and makes it really, really big. It's, it's in a small area and it blows it up. Uh, it, it, you're focused on that specific point. And the reality is, is I, I believe we're living in that, that uh, magnifying glass world today. Fears of the coronavirus are, are everywhere. And I believe this has really been the world's first ever social media induced panic. And it's scary <clears throat> for sure, uh, but I think we do hear uh, a lot of misinformation as well. And one of my favorite quotes, every time that we get into a, a, a season like this of, of uncertainty and, and a lot of volatility, I always come back to this quote. Uh, nobody knows exactly who came up with it, but uh, the quote is, if, if you don't read the newspaper, you are uninformed. If you do read the newspaper, you are misinformed. And I think that's very true. That's the way a lot of us uh, uh, feel and it, because it's accurate. And now we're all sitting at home. We're all watching news all day long or looking at social media all day long. And we're hearing so many different information points. And so my goal today is to try and bring a little bit of clarity to what we're hearing. Number one, I want to start off by saying I'm not a doctor whatsoever. I'm actually probably the furthest thing from a doctor. And, and so I really want to go by the data that we have. Uh, I'm not trying to say one way or the other whether uh, COVID is the most serious thing in the world or not. I, I, I don't think we really have enough data to know that yet. But I would say listen to, to doctors and listen to what you are hearing from doctors that it does need to be taken seriously. And especially for those who are over 60, and especially if you have a compromised immune system, I mean, you do need to be isolated right now. You do need to stay home. And I think that's the big question is, well, was should we have shut down the entire economy to do this? And when I kind of look through some of the, the social media type stuff, I think what's really important is, is to remember how much of an impact social media does have on us and, and on our mentality. For instance, if you Google news search right now, coronavirus, <clears throat> you're going you're gonna to bring up more than 3 billion search results for coronavirus. You look up any other big virus or, or disease that's killing far more people than the coronavirus around the world right now, and it might bring up, you know, a couple hundred thousand to a million to a couple million hits, but 3 billion, I mean, that's huge. And, and that's the world that we're currently living in today. And so I think it is important to kind of look into the data a little bit of what's going on with the coronavirus. And I think you can actually compare it to the flu and uh, using similar metrics, similar numbers. I'm not trying to say that it's better or worse than the flu in any way, but I think it's helpful to look at the data this way. And so far in the United States, we've had more than 2 million tests done for the coronavirus. It's been accelerating. I mean, just even a month ago, we're only adding maybe 100 a day. Now we're adding more than 100,000 new tests a day. That number continues to grow every day. That's a wonderful thing. Of those 2 million tests, so far about 400,000 people have tested positive for the coronavirus. And right now, about 13,000 people in the United States have died uh, uh, from tragically from the coronavirus. Uh, from COVID-19. And so when you, when you look at the case fatality rate, <clears throat> that's a word you, you've probably heard or heard a lot. Uh, essentially what that case fatality rate is looking at is the number of deaths that have occurred and they divide it by the number of people who have been infected or that have tested positive, not been infected, but have tested positive. We don't know the number of people who have been infected yet. So if you take a look at 13,000 divided by 400,000, you get about a, a 3.2% rate right now. That's your case fatality rate in the United States. And so what, when you look at models, they, a lot of them use this case fatality rate. And so they project this amount of population in the United States will have uh, COVID-19. If that happens uh, and the case fatality rate is 3%, that means X number of people are going to die. And these numbers have been astronomical. They've, they've changed many times, but they started off with millions of people are going to die. And now they've come down to a, a lot less than that, but still pretty high. Hundreds of thousands of people uh, are going to die from this. 
Uh, and I just don't think there's enough data to, to be able to make a decision either way. And the reason I say that is if you take a look right now at the flu, for instance, in the United States, so far we've had 1.2 million flu tests done in the United States. And of those 1.2 million flu tests, uh, we've had about 242,000 people test positive. Now the CDC estimates that 24,000 people so far this year have died from the flu. So if you look at the case fatality rate, the amount of people who have tested positive and the amount that have died, 24,000 divided by 240,000, that's a 10% case fatality rate. That's three times as high as what we saw for COVID-19. Now, we all know that one in 10 people that get the flu do not die. Uh, in fact, we know it's far lower than that. Uh, so what really matters, what you really need to know is how many people have, are infected with the virus, not how many people have tested positive, but you need to know the total people infected. For the flu, they estimate it's 39 million people so far this flu season in the United States. So when you look at uh, 24,000 divided by 39 million, that gives you a fatality rate of 0.06%. It's a lot different than 10%. And I believe once we find out more and more testing as it gets done here in the, the coming weeks and months, what we'll find out too is that COVID-19, although serious, uh, the fatality rate is far, far lower uh, than we originally expected it would be. And the only way we find this out is through a lot more testing. And the good news is that's happening. And the better news is, is even though we don't have the testing yet, it looks like within the next week, uh, we're, we're basically peaking here. The sad news is that people are dying every day from this. And if, if you've been impacted by it, a family member or a loved one, I'm so sorry. I mean, it's just devastating uh, that this is that this is taking place right now, that we have to deal with this. Uh, but it looks like the good news is things are starting to turn here. Uh, they turned, <clears throat> turned in China supposedly from as much as we can trust their data. They look like they're turning in Italy. They've turned in South Korea. They've turned in a bunch of other countries. And we believe here within the next week, it will turn as well. And that will be a, a, a real positive thing moving forward. And, and the, the, the wonderful thing is that we live in the United States and that our private sector is so vibrant and our entrepreneurship so vibrant that we have people working day and night to find a vaccine for this. And I'm, I'm confident that at some point here, whether it's in the next months or, or within the next year, we will have a vaccine for this. And there's a lot of other promising medications that have been tried out in, in many, many different clinical trials right now uh, that seem to be having some impact as well. And so I, I think we will move through, uh, no matter what, we'll move past this. Uh, I think it's actually going to be sooner than a lot of people really expect. And because of that, uh, I, I think it's, it's important for us to, to turn and look at the economy a little bit, because whether you agree with the government shutdown uh, or not, it's, it's the reality that we're dealing with right now. And what I do know is that it does have significant consequences uh, on the economy by shutting down business for a significant period of time. And so uh, when you think about small business, for example, we always hear that small business is the backbone of the United States. Well, why do they say that? Well, 30 million small businesses are in the United States alone, 30 million. And they employ about 60 million people, which is about 48.5% 48 of our entire workforce just in small businesses. And so when you shut down an economy, when you shut down all these businesses, it, it impacts these small businesses tremendously. It impacts all of their employees tremendously. Unemployment goes through the roof. And interestingly enough, uh, in 2016, J.P. Morgan Chase Institute, that's the think tank out of J.P. Morgan Chase, they actually did a study uh, where they went and they looked at small businesses and they basically said, okay, if revenues go to zero, how long could a small business last? And what they found was the median small business would only last 27 days if revenues went to zero. For a retailer, it was only uh, 18 days. For a restaurant, it's only 16 days. And so, I mean, here in California, we're well past 16 days that a lot of businesses have been closed. There will be a lot of small businesses that do completely go out of business here and they just they just don't come back and unemployment is going to go through the roof here 
uh, uh, pretty quickly. And, and I don't want to sugarcoat anything because this will be a very, very deep recession, but it will be very short. And, and so I think if you're focused right now, moving forward here, if you're focused on looking at uh, uh, the, the monthly data that's coming out, you're going to miss a lot of the story that's going on right in front of you. Because by the time we get a lot of that monthly data, uh, the worst of this will be behind us because businesses here will be opening back up. And so I think more importantly than looking at the monthly data coming out in the, the coming months, it's better to follow a lot of weekly indicators. And I've been able to find a pretty good list of, of weekly indicators that we can follow. We're actually putting a piece together and we'll make sure that uh, if you want a copy of it, we can get it sent out to you and it'll be updated every single week. But I wanna go through some of these indicators with you uh, that are, are are kind of interesting to look at and, and they're they're devastating numbers. I mean, really low. And so my point here is I just want to show you that things things have fallen off a cliff here and it's not due to a weak consumer or to an issue with, with business. It's due completely to a government shutdown. And so that's what's important to remember here. When you look at initial unemployment claims, so those that are filing for unemployment insurance, this comes out on a weekly basis. Last week, more than 6 million people in the United States filed. The week before that, 3 million people fought, filed. Uh, before that, the lowest level that we ever saw was back in the 1980s. It was about 700,000 for a week. And so these numbers have just blown everything out of the water, like nothing we've ever seen. You look at uh, weekly retail sales, uh, they're actually still up 4.3% from a year ago. Uh, that kind of makes sense as of now. A lot of people have been uh, going to the store frequently, buying as much as they can, shopping online. Uh, retail sales have not been overly impacted yet, but uh, we do believe they will be hit here for a, a short period uh, in the coming weeks. Box office receipts, so that's going to movie theaters. Uh, if you look at box office receipts, last week they only brought in $5,508 total around the United States. That's down 100%, and that's rounding, obviously, uh, but down from $184 million dollars the, the previous year that same week. You look at rail traffic, it's down 11.8%. Steel production's down 18.9%. Hotel occupancy was down 22.6% for last week. Uh, that's down 67.5% from the previous year. Uh, you look at TSA checkpoint data, so that's people coming through the airport that are going through security lines. Uh, as of two days ago, 108 people that day, 108,000, excuse me, people went through security lines at TSA. A year ago, that same day, it was 2.4 million people. Uh, so that's down 95.5%. And lastly, you can look at, at, at the supply of motor gasoline in the, in the United States. And so this looks at basically consumption of, of motor gasoline in the United States. For last week, it was down to, to 6.6 .6 million barrels per day. The year before, same, same week, it was over 9 million barrels per day. So this is down 27.1% from a year ago. This is the largest decline that we've ever seen year over year, going back to at least 1991. That's when this data was, was established. And so all this is to say, it's not to scare you at all, uh, but it's to tell you that things are pretty, pretty dire right now. But we know the reason they're dire is because government is completely shut off business. When a company goes from a really strong revenue to all of a sudden zero revenue, they're obviously were never prepared for anything like this. And that's the environment that we're in today. And so what's important about this and, and all that I've talked to you about so far is from this magnifying glass point of view. It's a single point in time. It's what we're living through right now. And if you get caught up in it, and it's so easy to do because that's all we're seeing, that's all we're reading about, it makes it feel like things will never go back to normal, will never be the same again. And in every crisis you go through, every recession, things do change on the margin a tiny bit, but mostly things go back to normal. And I think the exact same thing will happen this time around as well. And so that's why I think it's really important to back out here and to have a spyglass perspective instead of that magnifying glass perspective. And when you think about that spyglass, uh, you think about pirates, think all the way back to to when they had that, that they're on their pirate ship and they're looking out ahead and they can't see that far. So they pull out that big spyglass and they, they look out over the horizon uh, to get a clearer picture of what's to come. 
Uh, and, and I think that's exactly what we need to have today is that spyglass. Because when you think of, of just even the beginning of this year, you go back to January and February of this year, the economy was on exceptionally solid footing. In fact, growth in, in the January and February looked like the U.S. economy was growing at about a 3.5% annualized pace. Uh, March came around and it looked like it's, it's fallen by about 15% annualized. And then uh, so for the entire quarter, we're going to see a negative GDP reading of probably 1.5% annualized. Uh, second quarter, we see GDP falling by about 20%. Uh, annualized. It could be even worse than that. Uh, it's really hard to forecast anything because so much has just gone to, to almost zero right now. So it may be one of the worst readings. It will be one of the worst readings. It could be the worst readings that we've seen in, in history. Uh, but that's going to be a one quarter event. Third quarter comes around. We expect the economy to start to reaccelerate again. 5% growth in the third quarter, 5% in the fourth quarter, and then solid 5% growth next year as well. Uh, if, if you put that together, that's not a V-shape for the economy, but it's a U-shaped recovery. And you think about it, uh, not all small businesses are going to come back. Not all people are going to get reemployed right away. Uh, there will be a lag there. And uh, small businesses that do go under, uh, somebody may eventually take over that space and open up a new restaurant, but it takes time. And so, for us to get back to peak output that we saw back at the end of 2019, we'll probably take a year, year and a half to get there. But that's not to say that the, the, uh, the stock market will not have a V-shaped recovery, because we do believe that the stock market will have a V-shaped recovery. And uh, at the beginning of this year, uh, when you look at, at, uh, at the, the stock market hitting record highs, we believe that the market from our model was still undervalued based on where corporate profits were coming in. Well, you fast forward to today and all of a sudden the stock market's off, you know, 20% now was off about 30% or a little more than 30%. Uh, now it's come back somewhat. We believe that the stock market will continue to recover here. And if you look back over history, I think this is one of the best times ever in history, in the history of our lifetimes, and 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 anybody on this phone call, whether you're you're younger than me or or a lot older than me, I mean, I think it's one of the best times ever to be able to deploy money into this market. And I think we'll look back in six, twelve, eighteen months and say, "Wow, what an opportunity that we had!" Because the the same things that were in place back in January and February are going to still be in place. Uh, when we come out of this. And on top of that, now we have all this stimulus. And along with that, 0% interest rates and, and, a, and a Fed that is just beyond easy right now. And so all of that should lead to faster growth. And with that, we believe higher earnings and, and, and higher stock prices in the years to come. And I think what's, what's been driving this market higher uh, over the last 11 years is going to be the same thing that drives it higher over the next five, 10 years. And that's, that's that entrepreneur. It's, it's think of just all the new technologies that have come online uh, just in the last uh, 10 years, the cloud, the smartphone, tablets, I mean, 3D printing, hydraulic fracturing, horizontal drilling, which has revolutionized the energy industry, nanotechnology, biotechnology. I mean, the list goes on and on. And these are things that we would have never dreamt possible in our lifetime that here we are just a short, 10 years later, 11 years later, are all a reality. I mean, we look at Zoom. Uh, Zoom was established nine years ago, just nine years ago. And it went public less than a year ago. And here we are using this platform where in December of last year, it was the most users that they ever had. 10 million people were, were using Zoom on a daily basis back in December of, of you know, a couple months ago. Well, Zoom offered this service up to, to any school that wanted to take a, a, a use of it uh, during this period of time. 90,000 schools have taken Zoom up on that offer in 20 different countries. And, and so 10 million people were getting on. I'm sure they had trouble just managing 10 million with bandwidth. Well, in the month of March on a daily basis, they were averaging 200 million people coming on to Zoom. They have 1,000 employees. I mean, it's incredible. And those are the companies that we've created over the last 
10 years. We, we, we live in this world where, where as networks grow, they become more and more valuable. I mean, you think back to the original fax machine. I can't remember if it was the 1960s or 1970s. It was before I was born. Uh, but maybe one, some of you remember the original fax machine. Well, if you own that very first fax machine, I think it cost something like like three to, to $6,000 to buy. Uh, if you own that very first fax machine, I mean, how valuable was that fax machine? I'd say it wasn't valuable at all because you're the first one to own one. I mean, who are you going to fax? There's nobody to fax. You have the only fax machine that's ever been created. So maybe you're foolish to buy that for that price. But as you held on to it, as the years went on, more and more people got fax machines. And so the network got bigger and bigger and bigger, and that fax machine became more and more valuable to you. And that's the world that we live in today where the network effect is everywhere. I mean, you think about your smartphone. I mean, probably all of us had it. We couldn't FaceTime even seven years ago, and now here we are. It's just like a normal day of life to, to FaceTime if you have an iPhone with people. It's incredible. And, and you think every day that, that iPhone becomes more and more valuable because there's more information added to it through the internet. Uh, there's more apps that are added that you're able to access. Uh, there's software updates that are added and it becomes more and more valuable. And what we're gonna come out of this in the exact same environment that we went into it as, except now uh, people I think have really realized just how valuable these technologies like we're on today are. And I think it's changed, uh, I think, and, and as I said, I don't think the world's going to change, but I think things do change on the margin. I think one of those changes is that we're going to come out of this even more productive uh, than we could have dreamt possible because people now realize just how effective and easy uh, these communication softwares uh, packages are to use. And so there's a lot to look forward here. Not only that, you've got 5G coming on here, which is going to speed up everything. It's going to allow uh, computers and, and uh, software to connect like never before. It's going to allow for autonomous driving at some point down the line. Uh, you, you look at big data and artificial intelligence. I mean, those two things together are, are, are helping in this fight against the coronavirus in, in ways that were not even possible two, three years ago. And so I think the next 10 years is a, is a time period in the United States that we're going to look back and we're going to say, wow, we had such an opportunity right now. And, and for those of you who are saying, well, that's great. I don't have any cash and I'm just trying to, to, to hang on here and I'm scared to. I, I think I should go to cash right now. Uh, I, I just believe that would be a big mistake. Uh, there's always volatility in the market. And volatility is a, the price you pay over time to be able to make profit. And that's just something we have to go through. It's scary, I know, and it's hard to, 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 to just sit on it. Uh, but being a market timer has never worked out. And in fact, there's, there's fascinating statistics on uh, if you just missed out on the best one day, the best two days, the best three days of the market uh, in a year, it makes a tremendous, tremendous difference to your overall return over time. And so it's not fun to just have to hold on and make it through this, but the U.S. economy will be coming back here on solid footing, we believe, uh, relatively, relatively soon here. Uh, May will probably be in a recession here through April, part of May, but by June 1st, I think we'll start be, be in the recovery phase of the economy. And with that, we see stocks going higher and think it's a great time. Stocks lead a recovery. They always have, usually three to six months, and if that's true today, that means that we definitely hit the bottom here uh, a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if we have hit the bottom or not, uh, but uh, we believe that we most likely have and, and, and see the market moving higher from, uh, you know, with, with variation, a lot of volatility, but the trend higher from, from here on. So uh, with that, I'll just close by saying, I know it's very hard to get out of this magnifying glass point of view. I mean, I, I live in it, we're all living in it. We're reading it every single day and whatnot. But really, I think it, it helps tremendously if you're able to just take a step back here and just think about where we were and kind of just say, what if this whole thing uh, just wasn't really a reality? What if government didn't shut down business? What if things are allowed to open back up? And I think you'll see that we'll get back to normal here. It might take a month, two months, three months, 
uh, but we will get back to normal. And because of that, we should have a fairly strong recovery and stocks should continue to move higher. So with that, thank you so much. Uh, Dustin, I'll turn it back over to you uh, for any questions that may have come through. Yeah, thank you. That was wonderful. I can, I can hear the roar of applause from the crowd out there. So that, that was nice. <laughs> um, and I really like the, uh, the analogy you use of uh, looking at the markets and the economy with a spyglass versus a magnifying glass. And, and certainly with the news cycle, and we've talked about that in prior episodes. I mean, it's just talking about the last 24 hours. And if you're lucky, maybe the next 24 hours. Um, but it has a, you know, a very short-sighted history and, and is not looking really out to the future. So that's most of the news that we get and what we're concerned about. Um, but yeah, you know, and I, I had some questions, you know, I had, I had several questions lined up. I still have a couple I'm gonna ping you with, but you were touching on a lot of them and it's, it's easy for us to kind of get caught up in the negative. And I talked about this a little bit last week about there, there is maybe not a lot of positive stuff, but there are things that for us to be optimistic about, you know, and some of that ingenuity and technology networking and, and 5G is, is a game changer that, that we can't forget. I mean, that's going to impact, it, I think, a lot of markets. I'm sure you would agree, um, not just domestically. So, um, so I, so uh, if you're out there and you have some questions, go ahead and put them into that q and A. I'm gonna start taking my shots at Strider here, and then I'll I'll let you guys. But um, so so base so for for me and at Presidio, our, the, we talk about the big three, and these are the things that for our our clients investors um, that we want to make sure we have a plan to guard against, and that's inflation, taxes, and market crashes. And in our viewpoint, these these three things are dominating as far as they will all make your money worth 40% less with the wrong strategy, just in different ways. And it might take the market crash 18 months. It might take inflation six or seven years. It takes a stroke of the pen for taxation and some bad distribution planning with IRAs. So, you know, we really focus on those three things primarily. So first about the market crash, and I know that's what most of our conversations are around. So, um, and I think I've seen some questions kind of to this, to this extent as well, but you know, we all are waiting for, we, we're starting to see what we hope to see, the flattening of the curve. I know that's what a lot of us are, are looking for um, to see when we might, you know, stop the bleeding and and come back to some new normal that we're going to experience but you know prior to this crisis you know we did have a healthy consumer we did have a healthy economy but we have to imagine that the consumer is not coming back you know uh, like it was pre pre corona levels um, and that businesses aren't going to come back pre corona levels so even if i'm looking with that spyglass I mean, do you think that the market is pricing that in right now? Because it seems to me that they're pricing in when do we get back to business and, oh, we're going to have a really bad quarter, but then the, the, the next quarters are going to be good. And so, you know, how much of that is priced into the market that, you know, we're going to be dealing with a new economy, not the economy of old, and it's going to be weaker? Yeah, I, I, I think there, I think most of it has been priced in. Uh, my only concern is is how bad the numbers are going to be in the second quarter. Uh, I'm not sure if people have really priced that in yet. Uh, the the uh, the contraction ranges right now for a lot of estimates from minus eight percent uh, GDP to <clears throat> minus thirty percent GDP, and it could be you know to be honest, it could be worse than that. Uh, I don't think it's going to be minus eight, but it. It, it's going to just be, it's going to be pretty ugly. Uh, but I think what really matters is do we start growing again in the third quarter? Uh, I think that is what's really key. I don't think everybody realizes it's going to be a really big steep drop here. I don't think that's going to really matter, but what's really going to be the, the big thing is, are we going to start growing again in the third quarter? And as I said, this will be a U, it's not going to be a V. So we will come back. And I think people realize that because even growing, I mean, 5% growth is rapid growth relative to what we've seen over the past uh, 10 years, averaging around 2%, but we're coming off a lot lower base when you have that 20% annualized drop. And so it will take, you know, a year, year and a half to just get back to where we were at the previous peak. Uh, but with that, I think the, the faster growth that we'll see, a lot of companies will, uh, will hit their peaks uh, in earnings and revenues well before the economy hits its peak. And, 
in earnings and revenues. And so that's why I think there'll be more of a V-shaped recovery in the markets than, than we see actually in the economy. And so, uh, yeah, consumption might be a little slower to start with, but, uh, you know, that's, that's what's amazing about the consumer is, uh, I mean, you think back to 2000, 2008, 2009, people said, you know, we're in this new normal where the consumer's never going to spend money again. And yet consumption, if you take a look at the line, the growth rate before, <clears throat> excuse me, before we had the recession, and you look at the growth rate after the recession, they're, they're basically parallel lines, which tells you the rate of consumption before looks very similar to the rate of consumption after nothing really changed. I expect the consumer to still be very, very strong here. There's a lot of pent up demand. There'll be a lot of home buying. There'll be a lot of car buying. Uh, there are, there are a lot of things that we miss out on though, you know, like I need a haircut and uh, I probably need one a couple of weeks ago. I probably won't be able to get one for maybe let's say another month. So maybe I would have gotten two haircuts in, in the span and now I can only get one. So that's one haircut less, which a lot of people are going to have to deal with. Uh, uh, appointments and whatnot that you would have had that you just aren't doing now. Uh, so there is some loss of consumption for sure. Uh, and that's what that 20% uh, drop is. But uh, most of that will come back over time. And so <clears throat> I, I don't think the market is, it, I think the market's accounted for that. I think that 30% drop that we saw was sufficient and overdone. <clears throat> and in fact, if we look at our stock market model, our capitalized profits model for the S&P 500, to, to be fair value today, corporate profits would need to fall by about 20, uh, 50 to 70 percent, depending on what discount we put into that model to get to fair value. And we see corporate profits in the next quarter, you know, maybe falling by 25 percent, if that, you know, economy wide. There's a lot of companies that will be going to zero, but <clears throat> economy wide, uh, I think more like 25 percent. So, uh, I think we're going to come out of this just fine. It will take time, but uh, more V-shaped for the market, uh, more U-shaped for the economy. Yeah, and, and just for everybody listening there, you know, that's kind of what we were talking about last week is that the, the market is looking for uh, that light at the end of the tunnel. So even though the economy is still in what's called a U, like it still hasn't gotten better yet. And we saw this back in 2008, 9, and 10. And we were talking about that, you know, real estate market didn't bottom until 2011 while, while the stock market uh, really bottom and, and not all markets bottom in 11. Some of them took a lot longer, uh, speaking of residential real estate. Um, so so the, the stock market is the leading indicator. And so if they see a recovery, you know, a quarter or a couple down the road, the stock market's going to react favorably before everything else. So it might still look like lots of more unemployment, lots of more stimulus, you know, um, defaults on, on mortgages or foreclosures or businesses closing their doors, yet somehow the stock market is going to respond favorably because it's looking out into the future. So just like the, 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 the uh, restaurants didn't close their business and we didn't stop going to the store, all of that, all of that stuff happened after the stock market crashed. So, you know, you, you're going to see the market anticipate those things, right? So just like kind of Strider was talking about, we had a good quarter yet a horrible quarter in the stock market. Not a good quarter, sorry, but you know, what's probably yeah. not gonna amount to be a horrible first quarter. Some are sure, sure might, may, yep. not, may not be even negative GDP, right? Yeah, good, there's a chance. Yeah, we think it could be either plus one or minus, minus one and a half. So uh, yeah, definitely. Yet the, the stock market has a very different um, outcome, even though, you know, we, we might not technically be in a recession for this quarter. So we had some questions about that as, as how could the stock market be going up when everything is, is being so bad? And I guess it's looking in the future. And my last question to you on the stock market, uh, and then I, I'll move on to inflation and taxes is, um, my, I guess I guess one of my larger concerns is if we listen to healthcare professionals in the medical community, uh, they're telling us that uh, a vaccine is likely going to be probably 12 months out or longer to, to be realistic. And, and then, you know, in this country, you're, you're going to have to get people to actually take the vaccine, right? Whether we have had some, some uh, movement against vaccinations, I guess, in our country. So, you know, you got to not only produce the vaccine, but you got to have everybody have it. You know, you have to have lots and lots of testing, you know, 10 to 15 million tests need to be done, I hear, before we can reopen the economy. So, and then my, my number one concern, and what I wonder is how much of this do you think is priced in, is that 
you know, healthcare professionals are, are telling us that it's highly likely that we're going to, as we reopen the economy, you know, kind of see a new surge in cases. And if not, if we open the economy, could we see the surge this spring? And if not by next fall, you know, is this something that we're going to have to uh, maybe expect um, and to, to deal with again, where we have to shut down our economy and our lives, you know, before we have that vaccination out there? Yeah, that's, <clears throat> that's a wonderful question, and, and uh, I guess the hard thing is I'm not a doctor and, and have no knowledge on, on that side of it, uh, but I do have a lot of knowledge on the economy side of it, and, and I think so far, in my opinion, uh, the, the costs of shutting down the economy have far outweighed the benefits, and the reason I say that is because I, I'm sure as we go back to work, there will be uh, more people that do come down with the coronavirus, but I think what's really interesting from the data that we've collected so far is that those who are most susceptible to to having a uh, um, to being extremely uh, sick by this or being even killed by it are those who are older, but more specifically, anybody that has a compromised immune system or somebody who's a smoker. Uh, the statistics are are unbelievably clear that that's that's who's really uh, who it really affects the most. And so I think as we do open up the economy, uh, it, it, it'll actually be a, a good thing that more people do start to get the coronavirus. Most of most people who get it won't even show. They think it, 25 to maybe even 50% of people will be asymptomatic that receive the, that get the coronavirus. But when you, when you eventually get herd immunity, when majority of people uh, have been infected by the virus, you build up antibodies to it, and then <clears throat> that itself kills off the virus. There's nobody else that it can really attack. And once it's gone, uh, and, and we feel like it's pretty much gone, I think those who are susceptible, more susceptible to get it, uh, can can start going back out. So I think the way you really start to reopen the economy is, is allow those, uh, we, we need to do a lot more testing, no doubt. And there's a lot of new tests that are coming out, and I think what we're going to find out is that a lot of people have already had it. And I personally, and again, I'm not a doctor, but I think we're going to find out that more people actually had it earlier in January uh, or, or February before we even knew about it uh, than people realized. And it went down as the flu uh, instead of uh, uh, coronavirus. And, and so I think there's a lot of people that already have antibodies built up to it. Uh, only testing will really let us know. So I don't know the exact way that will open up the economy. Uh, but uh, your question, will this continue to go on for a long time if, if we don't? And, and I think that's the, uh, the dangerous part of this is that government has set this precedent now where uh, even with a lack of data, they, they can have the ability to shut down uh, an entire economy or, or close business. So it, it, it worries me about the future uh, is this something that is likely to happen again? Because businesses, this is something new now, never been done before, that businesses will have to try and, and plan for if it seems like this is a reality that government's going to do this in the future. <clears throat> I, I don't think, I think what we've realized from this, or I think what we will realize from this, is that it's not really feasible uh, to shut down an entire economy. Uh, I understand that maybe less people have been infected and there's probably been less deaths because of it. Uh, but there's 50,000 people, and I'm not trying to be callous about this at all. Every every death matters, and if it was somebody I knew, you know, I'd, I'd be just devastated right now, and I am very devastated for all those people that have to, to deal with this. But the reality of it is, is we live in this imperfect world where people die every day. In fact, just in the United States, every week about 50,000 people are dying, um, you know, uh, every single week uh, from just different things. If, if we go about this and say, we're going to try to prevent <clears throat> say 50,000 deaths from occurring in the United States that wouldn't have occurred by this, but people, most of these people that are getting it, uh, um, a lot of them were already, you know, pretty, pretty sick, uh, had a chance to, to maybe die from what they are currently dealing with. And the coronavirus kind of accelerated that, um, not to say that that's, that's better or worse, but to, to shut down the entire economy has severe consequences too. And when you go into a recession, there's many studies that have been done. 
Suicide rates go up quite a bit. Opioid addiction goes up quite a bit. Depression goes up quite a bit because there's a lot of people now that have just been put out of jobs. And so there's consequences either way. And I think uh, kind of shutting down the entire economy, we're going to start to see the, the ramifications of that uh, over the coming, the coming months. And I don't think it's going to be very pretty, as I've said. Yeah, absolutely. We're going to have um, some some challenges ahead, no doubt. And uh, it's going to be continue to be things that we haven't dealt with before. So, you know, we as a country and as a globe, we're going to have have some significant challenges. And I think you touched upon some of those. And, um, you know, e each loss of life is 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 devastating. And it, it is tough to make that that decision, you know, time and money, the only two things that we have that we can control in this world. Um, so my last, my last questions for you is, um, you know, probably something that, that you've, you've thought about yourself a whole, whole bunch, but, um, you know, we've had to take action like we have in the past, uh, you know, to stimulate the economy. So you commented on, you know, the easy fed $2 trillion stimulus package, you know, $4 trillion of bond buying, uh, by the, by the fed, uh, the care act 2.0 which we know is in works that could be, you know, they're talking about a $2.2 trillion uh, infrastructure bill and additional funding for households and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, we think we have a lot more to go. Um, and so, you know, with, with, at some point you talked about the, the economy coming back and I think about all this money that, you know, is, is um, all this government stimulus, you know, coming into the economy. And I mean, this has to be a perfect recipe for inflation to, you know, kind of rear its head for the first time. It's kind of been that sleeping uh, giant that, you know, we talk about a lot because it has a major impact on people's portfolios and their finances and, and things mm -hmm. that necessarily sure. do well in stock market crashes are going to be really negatively impacted mm -hmm. by inflation. And, and kind of that dovetails into that same thing is that, you know, if you if you look at this huge Fed balance sheet and, and you know, um, government debt, you know, there's only two ways to make that worth less. One is you need inflation and two, you need taxation. And so the, these other two and dealing with this market crash, and that's why we talk about these three all the time, because it's quite a balancing act. Um, so now we, we're trying to solve the market crash. And now, I mean, aren't we just kind of paving the road for, for significant taxation um, and inflation and, and pretty soon, I mean, next year? Yeah, I, I, I don't know if it'll be next year, but uh, I do believe in the, the near term, we will see significant taxation. Uh, I think that's, that's, that's the only way you can. The only way government can spend money is by either borrowing it or taxing it from the private sector. Uh, the good news is, is that if they have to borrow like they're borrowing right now, it's at rock bottom rates, which is uh, a positive. But, uh, you know, Milton Friedman, uh, one of my favorite economists, always used to say there's nothing as, as permanent as a temporary government program. And uh, it's true. If you look back over history, I mean, every stimulus that's ever been done spending never falls back to the level it was before that stimulus was put in place. It's always a lot higher. And so over the long term, we will see substantially larger government as a share of the economy. And I look at that as a big negative over the long term. Uh, and with that, that means higher taxation. Uh, I don't know if it will be, <clears throat> I doubt it would be next year, but uh, I think in the next couple of years, we will see taxes start to, to creep back up as government spending is, is going to be, you know, our deficits are going to be, you know, close to $2 trillion now or, or even more than that, uh, let alone they were a trillion dollars in, in good times. So that's, that's not a good thing. And, and really the issue is not, it's not on the, the revenue side. Revenues are, are where they should be relative to GDP. They're averaging around 17.5%, which is historically the average. Uh, spending on the other side uh, has averaged around 19%. Uh, 19 and a half percent of GDP. Right now, it's about 21 percent. That was before the stimulus. And so now as a share of the economy, it's going to grow quite substantially. And that's, that's a real negative over the long term. But in terms on the, in the inflation side, <clears throat> I completely agree with you. And again, Milton Friedman, what he always said is, is inflation is, is too much money chasing too few goods. And what we know is that we had a lot of demand back in Jan uh, January and February. We had a very strong consumer 
Uh, we don't have any demand right now because everything's shut down and everybody's inside. But when people start venturing back out, now you have the same things that you had in January and February, except now $2 trillion more in stimulus, 0% interest rates, and all the other things that the Fed has done to flood the, the system with liquidity. And so that's the perfect recipe for higher inflation. And so over in the next five years, I expect inflation to be well above 2%. I mean, I think pretty, pretty quickly it'll get up into the threes, fours. I, I don't really see anything like hyperinflation, but even if you're running at 3%, 4%, as you know very well, that makes a huge difference just in a couple of years with your, your purchasing power. And so I think all of everything, the way that you've put together your practice, those on those three things, I think there's really, when you think about it, not three better things to really focus on. And and coming forward here, I think you will need to protect against inflation somewhat, and you will need to to protect against higher taxes as well. All right, thank you for that. So um, I'm gonna I'm I'm looking through the questions from the audience here, and it looks like um, we've kind of hit on most of these. Uh, one one of the first questions was, when will companies start showing profits again, specifically industries like airlines, cruise, hotel, travel, entertainment, you know, kind of that discretionary spending sector, it sounds like. Yeah, that obviously they've been hit really, really hard. And I think a lot of people want to venture back into these companies because they've been hit so hard. But I do believe that exact, that, that, that industry will be the longest, uh, to, it'll take the longest for them to recover. Uh, you think about hotels, is I, I think it's going to take months for people to start to really fill out hotels again after they're actually uh, back open and in use. Uh, I think it's going to take a long time for planes to get filled back up. Uh, and so uh, profits in terms of that, that sector, uh, I think are going to be low. Uh, I don't think you hit a new record high there for, for probably at least another year. A uh, year and a half for for some of those areas. Uh, that's not to say that some of those companies aren't undervalued right now, but I think if you're trying to see if pro, you know wait for profits to get to new record highs, uh, out of any sector, I think that's going to take the longest to to recover. Yeah, and I mean certainly we we kind of saw that in the last recession, um, and so this one probably just magnifies that because of what caused this recession and what we're dealing with. So I mean that's typical yep. in a recession that you kind of see those lag the recovery, um, and and their drawdowns tend to be deeper. And you know here we have you know the exacerbation of the the um, you know coronavirus and, and quarantine. Um, so kind of on a uh, similar note, uh, uh, we have a question from Jerry that, you know, previously, and I'm, I'm assuming she's talking about coming out of the last recession, uh, sectors like real estate were a good investment. Um, so maybe for this time, you know, so, so uh, what are some good markets and uh, sectors where you think right now is an area where you're interested to invest and you think is opportune? Yeah, I think healthcare will be one of the big winners here. Uh, a lot of the political clouds have really lifted over healthcare uh, just in the last couple of weeks here, really. Uh, and I think uh, healthcare from a valuation perspective looked very, very good. A lot of it was because there were a lot of political clouds that were kind of hanging over it. Uh, I think healthcare is going to be a big outperformer moving forward here. And then you think about just kind of what we're doing here. Information technology, I think, is going to be a big outperformer as well, along with uh, communication service technology. Uh, you look at kind of bandwidth type companies, that type of thing. Uh, I think those are the areas that are going to do really well within technology, even in, in healthcare. Biotechnology, I think, is going to do uh, exceptionally well moving forward as well but most most cyclicals should uh, should come back uh, pretty strongly here I, I I think really the the laggards the ones that I would tend to <clears throat> to stay away from right now uh, would be more on the the energy side uh, I would I would tend to, to be more careful there I think you have to be very selective because uh, I don't see oil prices really uh, even with the meeting tomorrow, if, if things go really well, we could see a big bounce in, in oil prices, but I don't see them staying elevated around even around 45 to $50 per barrel. Fair value, we believe, is around 55 to $60 per barrel, but 
I think for a while, because there's such a lack of demand, there's a huge supply glut right now. It's going to take a, a long time to work through <clears throat> all that supply glut that, that we're currently seeing. And uh, just to give you an idea, I mean, in India, I just read today, um, their, their consumption of oil is down 70% right now. Uh, you think about airlines, how few flights are going out right now worldwide and even in the United States, the, the lack of jet fuel. Uh, I mean, there's there's significant, uh, there's not much demand for, for oil right now. And with this oversupply, I think that that's going to stick around for a while. Uh, but I, I do believe that within the energy space, uh, a lot of the bigger companies are going to be able to <clears throat> acquire a lot of these smaller companies for, you know, maybe 70 cents on the dollar or 50 cents on the dollar because they go under. And, and that means their cost basis is a lot lower for producing oil out of these different uh, areas, which over time will strengthen the economy. But oil is one, uh, the, the oil industry, the energy space right now is, is an area that I kind of stick away, stay away from and more heavily weight uh, uh, you know, healthcare, biotech, and even financials, I think, look, look fairly attractive here moving forward too. Yeah, I mean, if you're using that spyglass, you know, and, and you are thinking that, you know, we get through this and we get through this with some inflation and, you know, likely maybe some modest changes to interest rates, then, yeah, you have to kind of look at, you know, financials uh, being attractive, I think, at that. And, and some, a lot of the companies that, you know, we wouldn't be as interested in in an inflationary market are ones that actually have a lot of leverage on their balance sheets, uh, you know, as that debt becomes worth less and they're able to charge more. Definitely. <clears throat> sure. Yep. Completely agree. So we just have to not time the exact bottom of this uh, re recession and then we could just, you know, be smooth sailing, make that switch. No problem. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. What, I guess one other comment I'd make too about how real estate led the way or, or real estate turned out to be a good investment over the long term. That is true, uh, but it was because we, we obviously went through this big real estate bubble that popped and then absolutely collapsed and it collapsed further than it should have and then has come back and and i'd say real estate's pretty much at fair value right now around the economy but the difference between this recession and many mainly any other recession is that there was no real bubble uh that popped uh to, per se uh it was caused by government shutting down business and so i think we're we're very healthy coming into this. I think we're going to be just as healthy coming out of it. And so I, I don't see a, a real, uh, in, in that regard, a, a, a real play of something that has popped that is now significantly undervalued uh, uh, due to that bubble popping. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Absolutely. Um, let's see. I think we just have probably time for one more, and I think we only have one or two more. Oh, I wanted to ask you, and somebody okay. else put it up here too. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, we've I think we've talked today mostly centered around the U.S. markets, but you know, when we look at you know China, Singapore, South Korea, we kind of see them on the other side of this curve. You know, the Wuhan markets have opened up. You know, and and um, you know, for us in America, we would think of that, you know, as kind of the Chicago or, or Detroit there of, uh, of the United States, you know, a very industrialized city with 11 million people that were completely shut down, you know, so their markets yeah. have started to open up. Um, so, so what do you think about investing internationally in both developed or emerging markets, um, you know, maybe headwinds, tailwinds that you see there? Yeah, I think I, if if you are going to invest, I, I would still overweight the United States here moving forward. I think we had one of the strongest economies coming into this. And I think, again, we'll have one of the strongest economies coming out of this. And I think from a health perspective, uh, emerging markets, uh, I think is going to be a tough, uh, a tough place to be for a little while. Uh, number one, because a lot of these emerging markets, their healthcare systems are are pretty poor relative to de, uh, a lot of developed economies. And so if it really runs through a lot of these countries in a significant manner, uh, they, they could be uh, down for, for quite a while. Um, and a lot of these emerging markets are based off commodity prices. And so if, if demand comes back, that'll be a wonderful thing for these emerging markets. But I think it's going to take time for demand to come back. Uh, I think right now is too early for that, but if you're, you know, if you're slowly getting into these, I think over the next five years, there's there's a lot of promise in 
<clears throat> in a lot of emerging markets. If you look at more developed international economies right now uh, that are starting to recover, uh, China, for instance, um, for me personally, I, I always have a hard time looking at significant investing in China just because it's so hard to trust anything, uh, any of the data that's coming out. And, and uh, we will see here pretty soon, they probably won't say it, but uh, they, they definitely went through a pretty substantial recession in that first quarter. Uh, basically, we're, we're a quarter later because the virus hit us a month or two after it hit China and they shut down everything. Uh, so they are, they are in recovery. So they say, uh, I just don't know, you know, from stuff you read where there's starting to be more cases or the lack of cases that they had for their containment. I don't know. So for me personally, uh, I think it's, I, I, I prefer staying domestic because a lot of domestic companies have a, a, a huge amount of exposure internationally anyway. So you do, you do pick up some of that through those companies. Uh, but I think if you're looking out for the next five years, 10 years, and they look substantially undervalued to you, then yeah, I'd, I'd be slowly adding positions there. Well, we shared your view, Strider, so we're very cautious there. And, and you, had, you had have a pretty long spyglass uh, to- You do, very long. And, and, you know, we're, we're reading on it as much as we can. And, and there, I mean, there's so much data that we're getting that is so contrary to what you're seeing and so many different sources. So, you know, when you're getting that much misinformation, I mean, we talk about the misinformation of reading the newspaper here in the United States. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, try to read the headlines from, uh, from <laughs> is, is very challenging. Yeah. So yeah, yeah no doubt. Well, well, wonderful. I think that uh, hopefully everybody out there, we've done our best in answering all of your questions. Uh, Strider, thank you so much for joining us. It was fantastic having you on. We we'll hope to have you back. Oh, thank you. It was really fun. Yeah, yeah please do. That was a lot soon. of fun. Yeah. Perfect. Well, thank you guys. Uh, so you can tune in next week. We're going to have our uh, Presidio Perspective next Wednesday at four o'clock. We'll uh, send you the invites there. Please be patient with us. Uh, if you ever miss one of these to get you the webinar replays, they will come out. They're just delayed a little bit for compliance reasons, but thank you guys so much. We'll see you next week. Strider again, thank you. Everyone be safe. Hey, take care, Dustin. Have a good one.